greetings. This subsection will focus on the care of the clients with gas exchange disorder. As a disclaimer that this lecture is only intended for the level 3 students of the Bachelor of Science in Nursing program. This does not constitute medical advice and will be augmented by live sessions. If there are any concerns regarding this video, please email at the email indicated on this slide. Now let's discuss the care of the clients with gas exchange disorders. Among the first disorders in this group is your asthma. For asthma, remember that it is a chronic inflammatory disease of the airways. Take note of the word chronic, meaning it lasts for long. And then take note of inflammatory, which means it involves inflammatory processes. Now, let's talk about the pathophysiology of your asthma. Asthma is common among young children, but it also persists up to adults. Okay, now it's said to be common in all ages. However, it is said to start during the pediatric years. When it comes to sex, it is said to be more common among females compared to males. It also has a familial predisposition. Allergy, especially your allergy to foods, are the best trigger to asthma. You also have your environmental allergies, which can also trigger your asthma. Okay, exercise can trigger asthma, so as your stress. There are exercise-induced asthma, and there's also stress-induced asthma. Oftentimes, patients would complain that when they are in stress, they experience wheezing, they experience shortness of breathing. Hormonal factors may also have an influence. Medications. There are certain medication classes that can cause asthma. These medications may include your aspirin, some NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and then some beta blockers. There are, or in fact, all other medications can also cause an asthma attack if your patient is allergic to that medication. Respiratory tract infection, for example, your pneumonia, could also trigger an asthmatic attack. It is also said that asthma is more common among residents of urban areas compared to those who reside in rural areas. This is brought about by the concentration of pollutants which was found in urban areas. Now, with these factors combined, it leads towards your diffuse airway inflammation. As we mentioned, asthma is an inflammatory disease. Now, since it is an inflammatory disease, you would expect the appearance of your mast cells, T lymphocytes, and then eosinophils. Along with this will be the activation of your leukotrienes. Okay, so these substances are said to increase the blood flow um, and then would result to vasoconstriction later on. So these are the same substances which would trigger the inflammatory cascade for your asthma. So whenever these substances are activated, blood flow would be increased, vasoconstriction would increase, leading towards fluid leakage from the vasculature. Because of that leakage from the vasculature, there will be mucus secretions. And because of the secretions of mucus, it can lead towards airway edema and bronchoconstriction. Okay? Other than that, the airway also becomes inflamed. So there is an inflammation and there will be a deposit of mucus, referred to as airway edema. Okay? In the long run, that would result to airway remodeling. That's why patients with asthma would usually manifest in the chronic asthma, would manifest also with barrel chest. Hence, asthma is also sometimes considered as a COPD. Now, with this in mind, we need to understand that we need to halt this inflammatory processes so that your asthma manifestations will be mitigated or will be decreased. That's why you will see medications used in asthma to be anti-inflammatory medications such as your steroids okay now what are the signs and symptoms common is cough then you would have dyspnea the use of your accessory muscles of course the increase of the respiratory rate and then wheezing characteristic for asthma is wheezing in the long run the patient may have diaphoresis tachycardia there will be widening of the pulse pressure if you can recall, pulse pressure is the difference between your systolic blood pressure and your diastolic blood pressure. Your patient would have decreased SATs, okay? your hypoxemia, decreased oxygen saturations, and then central cyanosis. Oftentimes, they also say that they are choking or they feel the like they will be choking, okay? especially in exercise-induced asthma. Now, so as you can see on this slide, this is an healthy airway on the upper portion of the slide. You can see the normal bronchial lining or normal bronchial tube lining. In your asthma, you can see that there is inflammation of the lining. There will also be edema here or deposits, okay, or deposits of fluids or mucus. 
And then whereas in severe asthma, you would see already excess mucus, inflamed lung, and then severely tightened muscle. Okay? That's why oftentimes we say that if your patient with asthma would manifest with wheezing, and then the wheezing was suddenly gone, you would suspect that your patient is progressing towards severe asthma. Okay? If your patient is progressing towards healthy airway, your patient's breathing or breathing sounds should be audible. Still on the pathophysiology of your asthma and still on the signs and symptoms, okay, so we'd expect ABG to have the PaO2 to be decreased. And then for the PaCO2, it is expected to be decreased at first because your lungs is trying to compensate. Okay, the body is trying to compensate by in initially increasing the respiratory rate. So PaCO2 would be decreased initially. Again, due to the compensation of the body by increasing the respiratory rate. Later on, it will be normal, and later on, it would be increased. The normalizing and the increase of your PACO2 is an indication that your patient's asthma is being aggravated, or the condition of your patient is getting worse. One of the chemicals, okay, or one of the components of the blood which would be increased is your eosinophils. Take note that your eosinophil is a granulocyte which would be increased in allergic reactions. That's why if we will be taking WBC and our patient has an asthmatic reaction, we would suspect eosinophil to be increased. Other than that, you also have your IgE. Remember that we have five immunoglobulins, IgG, IgA, IgM, IgD, and IgE. Among the five, the immunoglobulin that will be increased during your asthma or allergic reaction will be your IgE. Okay, take note of that. Now, you can also have your sputum analysis. Your sputum analysis could be because of the deposition of the mucus, or you can also have your sputum analysis because of the occurrence of respiratory tract infection in our patient. We would want to know if there is a coexistence of your pneumonia or coexistence of other respiratory tract infection. Okay, for your PFTs or pulmonary function tests, you would expect the FEV to be decreased. So if you can recall, FEV is full expiratory volume. It is decreased because your patient could not exhale forcibly additional amount of air due to the narrowing of the airways. And because of that, because of the decrease of your FEV, your vital lung capacity is also said to be decreased. Since also because of the presence of your respiratory tract infection or possible respiratory tract infection, we will be ruling it out or confirming it using your chest x-ray. So those are the diagnostic tests for your asthma. Now, goals. Our goal for treatment for asthma is to improve airflow, to relieve our patient with the signs and symptoms, and then prevent future episodes. There are two classes of asthma medications. So you have your quick relief medications and then you have your long acting control medications. Your quick relief medications are the medications that will be used during an acute asthmatic attack. However, we deem that these medications cannot help our patient to prevent future episodes of asthma. In the same case, your long acting control medications cannot be expected to halt or stop an acute asthmatic attack. Okay, we would need your short-acting medications to stop an acute asthmatic attack. Your long-acting control medications is only good for control, meaning to prevent future asthmatic attack. Now, you have the first medication there on the list. The first medication on the list is your SABA. Okay, so you have your SABA or your SABA. Your SABA stands for short-acting beta agonist or your beta 2 adrenergic agonist. Recall that we have two betas, your beta 1 and your beta 2. Your beta 1 acts on the heart, your beta 2 acts on the lungs. So common example of, medic of medications in this category will be your salbutamol. You also have your albuterol okay, as your short acting beta adrenergic or beta 2 adrenergic agonist. Then you need to watch out for the common side effect, which would be palpitation. A common side effect of your SABA is palpitation. Okay, they are considered to be the rescue medications. Next is your anticholinergics. A common example of your anticholinergic is ipratropium. Your ipratropium is considered to be a cholinergic antagonist. 
Specifically, it attacks your muscarinic receptors. It targets your muscarinic receptors. It inhibits your muscarinic receptors to reduce vagal tone of the airway. So when I say vagus class or vagal, that will be activation of your parasympathetic nervous system. In this condition, asthma, there is uh, an exacerbation of your parasympathetic nervous system. Hence, what we want is to halt or stop the parasympathetic nervous system. Hence, we are giving your anticholinergic medications. Then let's go to your long-acting control medications. You have your steroids. You know that your steroids are anti-inflammatory medication. The most common oral preparation of steroid used for asthma is your prednisone. For intravenous preparation, you would have your methyl prednisolone. Okay, then for these steroids, take note that these are usually, these are not usually used long term. Because if your patient would be using this long term, your patient might develop Cushing syndrome or Cushingoid syndrome. On the other hand, okay, or in addition, if your patient will be using steroids for long periods of time, your patient will be at high risk for infection. Because as an anti-inflammatory medication, it could also be an immunodepressant. Then, another example would be your chromoline sodium, which is an alternative medication for treatment. So these medications are also said to stabilize your mast cells. If you can recall earlier, your mast cells is among the substances which triggers your asthma inflammatory cascade. Okay? Class, if your patient will be taking your corticosteroids, one of your nursing intervention is to tell them to rinse the mouth after administration to prevent thrush. Because common also to this one is thrush. When we say thrush, that will be, of course, development of your fungal infection. Now, let's go to your long-acting beta-2 agonist. Common example of medications under your long-acting beta agonist would be your theophylline and salmeteron. So these medications are used also for long-term control of asthma. Then you have your leukotriene modifiers, or you also have the term anti-leukotrienes. So these medications are anti-leukotrienes. These are class of medications that includes Montelukast. Okay, perhaps the most, most common example would be Montelukas, and then you have your Safferlukas, and then Zilutone. So leukotrienes, take note, are considered to be potent bronchoconstrictors that also dilate the blood vessels. So they are bronchoconstrictors, however, they are vasodilators. Leukotrienes are bronchoconstrictors and vasodilators. We don't want bronchoconstriction to occur in asthma. That's why the medication that we are giving is your leukotriene inhibitors or modifiers for that case. Okay, they act by interfering your leukotriene synthesis and by blocking the receptors where leukotrienes would exert their action. Then you have your immunomodulators. Your immunomodulators will be the one to prevent your IgE from binding to the high infinity high affinity receptors of your basophils and your mast cells. So take note that your IgE can trigger also for aggravating your asthma attack. Your immunomodulator's role will be to stop the IgE from doing this. And then you have your methylsantines. Your methylsantines are used when all other medications mentioned above will not be effective. Okay, One particular drug in this category is also your theophylline. Take note that your theophylline would have dangerous side effects such as your excessive cardiac and central nervous system stimulation which can include dysrhythmia, hypertension, and seizure activity. Nursing care for our patient. We advise our patient to do exercises. The exercise should be gradual. Aerobic exercises can be advocated for as long as, as, long as it is gradual. Okay? Now, you need to be careful on recommending exercise if your patient would have exercise-induced asthma. For other asthma types, you can have your exercises. Then you have oxygen therapy. Oftentimes, your patient would need oxygen for their breathing to be normal and for their hypoxemia to be addressed. You educate your patient. Patient education will be including or will include avoiding the triggers of asthma. Okay, Lifestyle management. Your patient needs to address obesity. Your patient needs to address stress to prevent future asthmatic episodes. And then a symptom and intervention diary is recommended. 
a symptom and intervention diary would document what were the symptoms experienced by your patient, what were the interventions done by the patient, and was it able to offer relief. In checkup, your symptom and your intervention diary would be able to tell the doctor if what are the best control measures for your patient or if your patient is experiencing an aggravation of asthma. Now let's talk about status asthmaticus. When I say status asthmaticus, it is defined as the rapid onset of severe and persistent asthma that does not respond to conventional therapy. Meaning, this is an aggravated asthma of your patient. This could be an untreated asthma attack for your patient. Take note of the words severe, rapid onset, and then does not respond to conventional therapy. Let's talk about the pathophysiology of your status asthmaticus. Basically, the reasons for your status asthmaticus is the same with asthma. Okay, infection, anxiety, dehydration, increase in alpha-1 blocking, and the nonspecific irritants and their hyperactivity to medications. One particular thing that added here is nebulizer abuse. So this would mean that if your patient is using nebulizer without the advice of the physician or if your patient is using nebulizer not as instructed by the physician, the tendency is for the airway also to be resistant to the effect of these medications. Okay, so the airway could not properly respond to the medication because of the inadvertent or non-judicious use of your nebulizer. So what happens? Basically, severe asthma, severe bronchospasm, mucus plugging, bronchoconstriction, all of this leading towards extremely labored breathing, wheezing, use of accessory muscles for breathing, and then distension of your neck veins. If your status asthmaticus will not be treated, your patient could undergo pneumothorax, or worse, your patient might have cardiac or pulmonary arrest. Diagnostic test. As previously mentioned in your asthma, initially, the diagnostic ABG would reveal to have respiratory alkalosis because part of your compensation for asthma is that the patient is breathing fast. Later on, it would progress towards respiratory acidosis because there is already narrowing of the airway, there is carbon dioxide trapping. Carbon dioxide is staying within the lungs of our patient. So what will be our management for this patient? Still your short-acting bronchodilators, okay? Or your short-acting beta ad agonist. So in this case class, the beta agonist could be administered every 15 to 20 minutes. Example of that is your salbutamol. We can give your salbutamol for three times every 15 to 20 minutes. Corticosteroids. In status asthmaticus, instead of using the oral prednisone, we are opting immediately for IV methyl prednisolone. Magnesium sulfate is also given to your patient. Your magnesium sulfate has a capability to relax, okay, to relax your airways. It is considered to be a smooth muscle relaxant. Okay, your magnesium sulfate, take note, is a calcium antagonist. So with that, it has small, a smooth muscle relaxation. Okay. However, since this is magnesium, it is not to be used routinely because your magnesium is also considered a high alert medication. You need to orient your patient okay, that there might be feeling of facial warmth, flushing, tingling, and nausea by the time that magnesium sulfate will be administered. As nurses, we need to watch out for CNS depression, respiratory depression, and hypotension. You also need to check for the deep tendon reflexes of your patient, urine output, and respiratory rate. Again, the three things that needs to be checked prior to administration of your magnesium is your respiratory rate, your urine output, and then your deep tendon reflexes. Why respiratory rate? Because magnesium sulfate could lead to respiratory depression. Why urine output? Because magnesium is primarily excreted through the kidney. If the kidney is not functioning, there might be a risk for hypermagnesemia. With hypermagnesemia, you can have signs and symptoms like your hypocalcemia. Okay, it's an emergency. It might result to heart problem. Why DTR or deep tendon reflexes? Your magnesium could halt the functioning of your neurosystem. Hence, the deep tendon reflexes needs to be checked. Then you need to administer oxygen and IV fluids. So for your oxygen, it needs to be administered via your nasal cannula. It could be administered also via your mask. And then you have your IV 
fluids. For this one, you need to be careful on the IV fluid because the IV fluid could also result to congestion, aggravating the condition of your patient. The IV fluid for asthma is intended to ensure fluid balance. Okay, and hopefully you will not allow your patient to undergo fluid overload. Okay, then another management will be emergency intubation. If your patient is not responding to these airway interventions, high flow oxygen, nebulizer, magnesium sulfate, steroids, you need to intubate your patient, okay, for your patient to have respiratory support. So that's it for your status asthmaticus. Now let's talk about chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Your chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is a preventable, slowly progressive respiratory disease that involves the airway or the lung parenchyma or both. Again, it involves the airway, the lung parenchyma or both. Now, let's go towards the pathophysiology of your chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. In your chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, it is caused by exposure to noxious particles or gases. Because of this exposure, there will be inflammation that will be happening. And since inflammation is happening, hypersecretion of mucus would occur. Because of the hypersecretion and inflammation combined, there will be thickening of the airway. In the long run, the thickening of the airway will result to wall fibrosis. Okay? The alveolar walls will be fibrotic or the bronchial walls will be fibrotic. Because of that, there is scar formation. So because of this, there is decrease in elastic recoil meaning your lungs could not inflate, your lungs could not return to its normal state. And then, later on, there will be smooth muscle hypertrophy. You know that if there will be smooth muscle hypertrophy, that will still result to bronchio, bronchial constriction or narrowing of your airways. And then, in the long run, there will be pulmonary hypertension. So, pulmonary hypertension is caused by the activation of your vasoactive substances. It is also caused by the narrowing of your airways. Okay, meaning there needs to be an extra effort for blood to go towards your pulmonary area. So with that, pulmonary hypertension, hypertension I mean, would result. So your COPD of two kinds is usually your emphysema and your chronic bronchitis. Oftentimes, this patient would complain of easy fatigability, frequent respiratory infections, use of accessory muscles to breathe. Okay, by the way, the frequent respiratory infection is because of the damage to the alveoli. Okay, because of the damage to the alveoli, there is a damage to your alveolar macrophages. Because of the damage to the alveolar macrophages, your patient would not have a good protection on the lungs when it comes to infection. Then your patient tends to become orthopnic. They could not tolerate position lying down. They have wheezing, bursley breathing. There could be chronic cough. And then barrel chest, as we've discussed in the assessment, dyspnea or difficulty of breathing, prolonged expiratory time. Okay, and then they would be thin in appearance. One particular complication that could happen is your core pulmonal. Okay, core there refers for cardiac pulmonal, there refers to the lungs. So when we say core pulmonal, these are cardiac complications that were brought about initially by lung problems. Okay, hence the term core pulmonal or core pulmonal. Now, still on the pathophysiology of your COPD. Okay, what we added here on this slide are the common risk factors. So age, of course, the higher the age, the higher the risk. And then if you can recall our discussion on familial predisposition, once your patient lacks alpha-1 antitrypsin, okay, there is a tendency for the lung tissues to be destroyed. Because remember, okay, your trypsin is something that can cause lysis to your lungs. If there is no alpha-1 antitrypsin, if there is a deficiency of alpha-1, lung destruction would continue. Lung destruction, quote and quote. Then you have exposure to tobacco. Then you have air pollution and then passive smoking. So all of this results towards scar formation in your lungs and then later on pulmonary hypertension and then after pulmonary hypertension, your poor pulmonal. Let's discuss one type of your COPD. So emphysema. In your emphysema, there is abnormal distension of the air spaces beyond the terminal bronchioles and destruction of the walls of the alveoli. Okay, again, there is abnormal distension of the air spaces beyond the terminal bronchioles and there is destruction of the walls of your alveoli. Take note of the term abnormal distension. The key characteristic of your emphysema is air trapping. Okay, there is air trapping. Now, 
your emphysema commonly we refer to your emphysema as pink puffers because they look like with flashes there is increase in CO2 retention. That's why your patient would appear to be pink. Because take note, your CO2 is a potent vasodilator. There will be no cyanosis. We rarely see cyanosis among patients with emphysema. They would have first lip breathing and dyspnea still. There is ineffective cough. Okay, so the tendency of your patient with dyspnea is just to cough. It's non-productive. Hyperresonance and chest percussion. The hyperresonance was brought about by air trapping. Orthopnic and barrel chest, common in COPD. Exertional dyspnea. Then you have prolonged expiratory time, also common in both the COPDs. They speak in short, jerky sentences. They could not complete a sentence because they would be running out for air. They may appear anxious, use of accessory muscles, thin in appearance. And this also leads to your right-sided heart failure. Okay, Still looking towards your core pulmonary. So unique for your pink puffer or your pulmonary emphysema is the increase of your CO2 retention, absence of cyanosis, and then ineffective coughing, okay, and hyperresonance on chest percussion. So this delineates your pulmonary emphysema from your um, bronchitis or chronic bronchitis. Now let's talk about the pathophysiology of your emphysema. So looking at the pathophysiology of your emphysema, as I have mentioned, there is air trapping. So because of the abnormal distension of the air spaces, there is destruction of the alveoli walls. Okay, Because of this destruction of alveoli walls, there will be disruption of the parenchymal tissues, meaning the tissues of the lungs are being destroyed because the alveolar walls are destroyed. Because of that, there will be a decrease or I mean an increase in our dead space. Supposedly, the dead space should only be 150. But when it comes to your um, when it comes to your emphysema, the dead space is increased, meaning the amount of air that does not participate in the respiration and gas exchange is increased. It's more than 150 mL already. Then there will be impaired oxygen diffusion. Because of impaired gas exchange, hypoxemia or decreased oxygen levels in the blood would result. Other than that, there will also be a decrease of the pulmonary capillary bed, meaning the capillary bed where gas exchange takes place is decreased. Because of that, your heart will try to compensate by increasing the blood flow towards your lungs. And because of that, there will be increased resistance also to pulmonary blood flow. Okay, With the combined effort of the heart and then the increased resistance in the pulmonary blood flow, okay, because of the scarring that occurs there, right ventricular hypertrophy would occur. Okay? Because the heart is exerting additional effort just to place the blood or to put the blood inside your lungs. Okay? There will be right ventricular hypertrophy in the long run. And then if you can recall your heart failure discussion, if you have left-sided heart failure, the tendency is pulmonic manifestations. This time, since this is the right, you would have your systemic signs and symptoms. So for your systemic signs and symptoms, you would now expect the patient to have edema. You'd have your patient, you have your jugular vein distension, okay, on all those systemic signs and symptoms, including your ascites. Now, the two major changes that happens in your um, emphysema is the loss of lung elasticity and then hyperinflation of the lungs. Again, the hyperinflation of the lungs is brought about by air trapping. Because of the hyperinflation of your lungs, the tendency is for the diaphragm to be flattened. With the diaphragm flattened, there will be weakening of the effect of the muscle. Again, the effect of the muscles is weakened. Now, so what are the risk factors? The risk factors will be the same with your COPD. Smoking, alpha-1 antitrypsin inhalation of irritants leading towards your emphysema. Now, let's go about to chronic bronchitis. When I say chronic bronchitis, inflammation of the bronchi and the bronchioles. The difference there is that your chronic bronchitis does not involve your alveoli, compared to your emphysema that it involves your alveoli. Well, initially, your alveoli will not be included, but part of the sequelae of your chronic bronchitis will still be damaged on your alveolar walls. Now, if we have pink puffers for emphysema, we commonly refer to chronic bronchitis as blue bloaters. Okay, their color is dusky to cyanotic okay, because, take note, the air could not go towards the alveoli. Then, recurrent cough and sputum production. If you can recall an emphysema, there is decrease or ineffective cough. However, for your chronic bronchitis, they can produce a lot of sputum. Hypoxia hypercapnia is common in your COPD. 
Acidosis is common because the carbon dioxide could not go out. The patient tends to be edematous because, again, there will be right-sided heart failure, systemic signs and symptoms. Respiratory rate would be increased. Exertional dyspnea will still be there. Increased incidence in heavy cigarette smokers. And then digital clabbing. Your clabbing is, in fact, common in both the COPD because of chronic hypoxia. You would have clabbing. And then there will be cardiac enlargement. As we have discussed, right ventricular hypertrophy due to the increase of pressure in your lungs. A heart needs to exert extra effort for the blood to go to the lungs. Then use of accessory muscles is also there, which is common for COPD. And then you have your core pulmonary. Now, what is unique again in your blue bloaters is this. The color does get to cyanotic. They become cyanotic since air could not go through the bronchi, bronchioles. They have recurrent cough and sputum and production. Then you would have... Uh, that's it. Those are the unique. So the unique is color does get to cyanotic. That's not an emphysema. And then recurrent cough and increase in sputum production. Because in emphysema, you would have... Uh, you would have ineffective cough. Now, signs and symptoms, or I mean pathophysiology for your chronic bronchitis. So in your chronic bronchitis, what happens is that there will be airway irritation. Because of this airway irritation, inflammation and hypersecretion of mucus would occur. There will be mucus plugging, but the mucus is just plugging on the bronchial walls. Okay, it is the bronchus which is primarily affected. Later on, as I have mentioned, although not the initial one, but later on, it will have damaged alveoli, later on resulting to altered alveolar macrophage function. If the macrophages function will be damaged, you know that it will already result, okay, it will already result towards your decrease of immune resistance towards infection. So clinical manifestations of your COPD, your patient would have chronic cough, intermittent and unproductive, there will also be sputum production, especially for your chronic bronchitis. Then you would have your um, dyspnea or difficulty of breathing. You would have your barrel chest. Your barrel chest is because of the chronic hyperinflation. Okay, so your barrel chest would have as a complication. It results from a more fixed position of the ribs in the inspiratory position. It's as if that the ribs is already a custom that is always expanded because there is air trapping. And then other than that, you would have your tripod position. So your tripod position is a typical position wherein your patient would be leaning forward to use the accessory muscles, forcing the shoulder girdle upward and causing the supraclavicular fossa to retract on inspiration. So it's referred to as tripod because it is the body supported by the two hands or two arms of your patient. Hence the term tripod. And then you would have systemic or extrapulmonary manifestations of COPD. Okay? Your patient would manifest with signs of musculoskeletal wasting. They would appear very thin and then later on they would have metabolic syndrome. Laboratory. So for your ABG, of course it's for baseline purposes. Okay? You would expect to have acidosis for this patient because of air trapping. And then later on, okay, yeah, acidosis. Then sputum culture, in case there are kinds of infection, because remember, your patient will be at high risk for infection. Next, hemoglobin and hematocrit. One complication of chronic hypoxia is polycythemia. So take note, polycythemia. So for us to check for the presence of polycythemia, we need to have hemoglobin and hematocrit. We screen for the possible uh, deficiency of alpha-1 antitrypsin, which is one of the familial predisposition for the presence of your uh, one of the familial predisposition for the presence of your emphysema. For imaging, you would have chest x-ray to rule out other diseases and to exclude other diagnoses. A high-resolution CT scan could also be done okay, just to rule out other diagnoses. So when we say differential diagnosis for us to rule out other causes of the dyspnea of your patient. In pulmonary function tests, we expect the FEV or the full expiratory volume of our patient to be decreased. Your patient could not excrete or could not exhale beyond the tidal volume very well because take note, there is constriction of the airways. And again, there is air trapping. Air is staying inside the lungs. It could not be out. And then pulse oximetry, of course, would check for the presence of your autosaturation or your desaturations. So as COPD worsens, the amount of oxygen in the blood decreases. 
okay, we refer to that one as hypoxemia. And then the amount of carbon dioxide in the blood also increases. The amount of carbon dioxide tends to increase. That's why if you can recall, among our patients who is experiencing COPD, we are only supposed to administer okay, 2 liters per minute of oxygen. Because if it will be more than 2 liters per minute, take note that the drive for breathing of your patient is increased carbon dioxide. If I will be decreasing the carbon dioxide of my patient abruptly by giving too much oxygen, my patient's drive for breathing will halt. Complications. You have respiratory insufficiency, respiratory failure. Okay, That may result because of chronic or acute COPD. Then, you also have infection, such as pneumonia, okay, chronic atelectasis or collapse of your lungs, pneumothorax, and then pulmonary arterial hypertension that we also refer to as core pulmonale. Therapeutic management. Improved ventilation. You need to remove the secretions. So hence, you need to soften the secretions, administer medications that can soften the secretions, prevent complications, slow progression of clinical manifestations, and promote health maintenance. Medical management. Your medical management will be you have your bronchodilators because remember our problem is the thickening of the airway, the blockade on the airway. So we need bronchodilators. For your beta-adrenergic agents, it could be long-acting, it could be short-acting. Then you also have your cholinergic antagonist. So as I mentioned, your cholinergic antagonist could offer a relaxation on your bronchial muscles, okay? bronchial muscle relaxation. These are anti-parasympathetic drugs. So this, the effect would be sympathetic. Then you have your, uh, by the way, for your bronchodilators, it will be more advisable for your patient to have it via inhalation because the effect of inhalation is more um, prominent compared to the effect of your oral medications. Then you also have your methylsantines, and then you also have your steroids. So common example of your methylsantine is your theophylline. And then for your steroids, okay, so you have your prednisone and methylprednisolone. However, take note that for your steroids, your steroids are not usually administered for prolonged intervals because it might result again to respiratory problems. Okay, steroids per se is an anti, uh, what you call this, is an immunosuppressant. Hence, increasing the risk for infection. Other than that, there is what you refer to as steroid myopathy, which can lead to muscle weakness, decreased ability of the muscle to function. If that's the case, if there will be a decreased ability of the muscle to function, you will be thinking of your diaphragm. If your diaphragm's function will be impaired, your patient's breathing will be worsened, especially in COPD. That's why we need to be careful also in administering steroids. Okay? If patient lacks alpha-1 antitrypsin, we give our patient alpha-1 antitrypsin. Since the patient has a lot of mucus, we give N-acetylcysteine or flumosil, which is a mucolytic agent. Since patient is at risk for infection, might have an infection, we give your antibiotics. Since our patient is having pulmonary hypertension, vasodilators could be of help to your patient. Narcotics. For the administration of your narcotics, you need to think twice or you need to be very careful. Okay? Your narcotics is intended there to decrease the oxygen demand of your patient. Again, to decrease the oxygen demand of your patient, meaning this would allow your patient to rest for a little while, decreasing the oxygen demand. However, take note your narcotics. Instead of just relieving on pain, your narcotics could also cause respiratory depression. Hence, before you administer your narcotics, you still need to check for the respiratory status of your patient. Then, you have your oxygen therapy. As I have mentioned, your oxygen therapy should not be too much. It should not be more than 2 liters per minute. Administering too much oxygen can result in the retention again of carbon dioxide, and then your pulse oximeter could be a good determinant for the response of your patient to oxygen therapy. Now, for your oxygen, since it is 2 liters per minute, you know that oxygen for 2 liters per minute is administered via your nasal cannula. However, if you will be asked if what is the most uh, suitable, if what is the most suitable oxygen administration device which is most accurate the best answer will be the venturi mask okay the venturi mask would administer it more accurately okay then you have your surgical management then 
treatments for the surgical management, you have your bulectomy, you have your lung volume reduction surgery, and then you have your lung transplantation. For your bulectomy, as the term implies, bullet, okay? You're, there's removal of your bullus, okay? Especially your air emboli, which is present in your emphysema. Then you have your lung volume reduction surgery, which involves removal of the portion of the diseased lung parenchyma. So the purpose of that is to reduce hyperinflation. Okay, to reduce hyperinflation. It is not curative, only palliative. Then you have your lung transplantation, which is a definitive surgical treatment for severe COPD in selected patients. Okay, it is intended for severe COPD in selected patients. Now, the nursing management. One of our goal is to assess the patient. Okay, that will be the breathing information of your patient and then achieving airway clearance. So in achieving airway clearance, the nurse must administer medications properly. All pulmonary irritants should be removed. Okay, you should have the patient to have directed or controlled coughing so that fatigue will not be occurring. And then later on, okay, you need to have to do, to do chest physiotherapy with postural drainage. Intermittent positive pressure breathing may be done. So IPPB may be done using your bag valve mask. And then you can have increased fluid intake and then aerosol mist. Aerosol mist is usually with your normal saline and water. Aerosol mist is done with your normal saline or water. To improve breathing patterns, one of our uh, nursing intervention okay, could be to have the first lip breathing or educate our patient on first lip breathing because that would help them on slowing down expiration. Okay, prevent collapse of your small airways and control the rate and depth of your respiration. Other than that, it could promote relaxation and allow the patient to gain control over dyspnea. Take note that your breathing pattern problem is brought about by air trapping. Next, improving activity intolerance. Okay, or improving activity tolerance because our problem is activity intolerance. So you need to have rehab therapies for this one and ask the patient to pace the activities throughout the day, okay? And use supportive devices to decrease energy expenditure. So some patients, for example, would use walking aids such that they will be using minimal energy. Then monitor and manage potential complications. So for your potential complications, that will be respiratory insufficiency, you need to watch out for cognitive changes because if there are cognitive changes, that may mean that there is already severe hypoxemia in such a way that the amount of oxygen that goes towards the brain is already limited. So it's a sign of impending respiratory failure. Okay, you monitor the pulse ox reading of your patient and instruct the patient to report any sign of infection. So if there is occurrence of fever or change in the color of the sputum or consistency or amount, it needs to be reported right away because it suggests infection. And if your patient would have infection, that would aggravate the condition of your patient. Hence, infection needs to be treated. Next, atelectasis. So for your atelectasis, there is closure or collapse of the alveoli. There are two kinds of atelectasis. It could be chronic or acute. So your acute atelectasis is common among your patients who are on post-op setting or in people who are immobilized and have shallow monotonous breathing pattern. So because of immobilization, lung collapse may occur. Now, it's again common among post-op patients. Take note that excess secretions or mucus plug could also cause an obstruction on the airflow, also leading towards atelectasis. For your chronic atelectasis, these are patients with chronic airway obstruction that impedes or blocks the airflow to an area of the lung. Possible causes of your atelectasis would include altered breathing patterns, retained secretions, pain, Altered, alteration in small airway function, prolonged supine positioning, increased abdominal pressure, reduced lung volumes due to musculoskeletal or neurologic disorder, restrictive defects, and then specific surgical procedures. For the possible causes, so we have been touching this on the disorders. For your surgical procedure, just remember that post-operative patients are at high risk for atelectasis because of the monotonous, low tidal breathing pattern causing the small airway closure and alveolar collapse. Okay, remember the tendency of your post-op patient is not to, quote-unquote, breathe fully because of pain. Because of that, their breathing tends to be monotonous. The air is not reaching the ends of your alveoli. So because of that, there will be small airway closure, and then later on, alveolar collapse. 
So assessment for this patient, you would have DOP or dyspnea, then cough, then sputum production is common. There will be marked respiratory distress because there is collapse of your lungs, including tachycardia, tachypnea, pleuritic pain, central cyanosis, and even difficulty of breathing and supine position, which is your orthopnea, and then patient would have anxiety. So these are signs of marked respiratory distress. Hallmarks of severe atelectasis or severity of your atelectasis, you have tachypnea, dyspnea, and mild to moderate hypoxemia. So once your patient is manifesting with these signs and symptoms, your atelectasis is getting more severe. Diagnostic studies will still be your x-ray. It can be seen in the x-ray if there is collapse of the lungs and then pulse oximetry also. Prevention and management. So if you're talking about your patient who have undergone surgery, your patient should be on uh, frequent position changes. We encourage early ambulation to allow for lung expansion. Deep breathing and coughing exercises are strongly recommended. Of course, the use of your incentive spirometry. And then administer opioids and sedatives judiciously. Again, why? Because your opioids and sedatives could possibly result to respiratory depression. Okay, it could possibly result to respiratory depression. Next, postural drainage. And then suction your secretions as indicated. Okay, so we have the eye cough. Part of the management also is your eye cuff program, which can be found in your textbook. So eye cuff is eye, insensitive spirometry, incentive spirometry, I mean. Then C, coughing and deep breathing. O is oral care, which includes brushing and using mouthwash. Understanding you, okay, patient and staff education. G is getting out of bed, okay, at least three times a day. And then H is head of bed elevation. These interventions, the eye cuff, detailed in your textbook would allow for proper lung expansion and preventing atelectasis. So your overall goal is to improve ventilation and remove secretions. Okay, so you can have your lung expansion maneuvers. When I say lung expansion maneuvers, you have deep breathing exercises, incentive spirometry, coughing. Okay, then you also have your positive and expiratory pressure. We oftentimes refer to this one as PEEP. Okay, for your PIP, you have a simple mask and a one-way valve system that provides varying amount of respiratory resistance, which would usually be a 10 to 15 centimeter water. Okay, so meaning it pushes pressure towards your lungs to allow for expansion. Then you also have your CPPB or your continuous positive pressure breathing. Okay, you can have bronchoscopy if due to lung cancer or non-malignant lesion for us to remove that lung lesion. The nebulizer treatment could also be done, intubation in severe cases, and then thoracentesis if it is caused by pleural. Now we have your pulmonary edema. Pulmonary edema is an abnormal accumulation of fluid in the lung tissue, the alveolar space, or both. Do not confuse pulmonary edema with pleural effusion. When I say pleural effusion, the abnormal deposits of fluids is in the pleural space, whereas in, pleural, in pulmonary edema, it is on the lung tissue itself. It's not on the pleura. So pulmonary edema could be a result of direct injury to the lung. It could be because of the hematogenous injury to the lung. It could be because of the injury plus elevated hydrostatic pressures. So when I say hematogenous injury in the lung, it could be because of blood-borne pathogens. Classic sign of pulmonary edema is your pink frothy sputum. Clinical manifestations. There will be a sudden onset of breathlessness. There is a sense of suffocation. There is the kidney tachypnea with noisy breathing, and then there will be low oxygen saturation, and then pale to cyanotic hands, okay, that is sometimes cool and moist. Diagnostic test, ABG of course, to evaluate for the oxygenation status of your patient. Then you'd have electrolytes, because electrolyte imbalances could also lead to fluid problems. BUN creatinine, because oftentimes the deposits, the deposits of the fluids in the lung cavity of your patient is brought about by kidney problems, and then chest x-ray to visualize for the extent of pulmonary edema. Medical management. You need to give oxygen for your patient because the lung capacity is decreased. A non-rebreathing mask is used to increase the oxygen supply of your patient. There could be assisted ventilation. So when I say assisted ventilation, that could be in the form of your non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. When I say non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, that may be in the form of your CPAP or your BiPAP, okay? Just like the ones that we had on your obstructive sleep apnea. 
So positive pressure is being done in such a way that the pressure will be able to expand or help in the expansion of your lungs. Then invasive will be your EP intubation and mechanical ventilation. So once ventilation is done or intubation is done, it's already considered to be invasive. Other than that, since we're talking about fluids, you'll be giving diuretics. So the purpose of your diuretics is to excrete the excess water that your patient have. So example of that is your furosemide. Your furosemide could be given IV push or drip for this case. Drip since it might be needed to be done continuously to ensure that the fluids of your patient are continuously excreted. Just make sure that before the administration of your furosemide, you will be able to check for the blood pressure of your patient. Then you would have administration of your vasodilators and then your nitroprusside. You're expecting cardiac complications for this patient. And then other than that, your vasodilator or your vasodilation could also help on the drainage of the fluids of your patient. Okay, that will be the end of our discussion on pulmonary edema. One thing that you would want to read about pulmonary edema is your rotating tourniquet. Okay, try to read about the application of tourni rotating tourniquet in the management of your pulmonary edema. Thank you very much for your attention. I would like also to thank Professor Gesto for the outline of this PowerPoint presentation. God bless.